We are so glad that you are a part of the VNC tribe. And by joining us online today, that doesn't make you some observer. It's all about participation. And as we try to continue to figure out ways to connect through the realities of the pandemic and being part of the, well, just the world we're in right now, we want to make sure that you are finding connection as well. Do you know we have different and new life groups that are kicking off here, not only in person, um, but also online. And some of these life groups will be short-term, some are long-term, but either way, we would love for you to continue to find ways to connect with others and just, man, grow in your faith as you grow with others. Check out valponaz.org slash life groups to get some more information on both in-person and, uh, in, and online opportunities. Hey, today we kick off a brand new series called Reflect, and it's going to be an interesting three weeks. And I hope in these three weeks, you have the opportunity to really stretch and grow in your faith. But first, we want to start with a question. And it's pretty much a very simple question, but I want you to talk with the people that you're with or hop in the chat and and speak there as well. But what's something about yourself that you would like to change? Well, we'll come back to that question in in just a few moments, but I want to talk about the series called Reflect for a moment, and and it comes from imagery that I've honestly shared before, but it's the analogy of sunlight versus moonlight. And when we think of light during the day, we know that the sun is the source. It's what gives us light. And during the night, you could argue the moon gives us light, sort of. The moon isn't actually the source of light, it is reflecting the light of the sun and sort of describes how you and I live out our faith following Jesus. We want to reflect Jesus, but we're not the source of the light, he is, and he is the source of life, and he is the source of everything. So if I'm going to follow Jesus, I want to reflect him in this world that I live in, but I also know that I want to do that well. And that is what I want us to talk about in these next few weeks. Man, let's start that conversation today. When it comes to living that out well, reflecting who Jesus is in our lives, if we're going to talk about that, then we're going to have to get pretty real with each other. And are we willing to admit as we walk out our faith and even acknowledge it to ourselves right now that there are difficulties along the way? Difficulties along the way of trying to reflect Jesus well and live out following Jesus. Uh, the, part of the problem is we, we learn all the cliche phrases. Uh, whether you're new to um, the church experience or maybe even you're still trying to figure all this Jesus stuff out, even you probably know some of those phrases, some of the things that just sound really spiritual. They sound really good. We can even sing with great passion. and In the moment, we can mean the words that we sing. But when push comes to shove in life, well, we, we struggle. We struggle to live the very words that we just sang in church, and we struggle to live some of the very phrases that we pass around. To follow Jesus and to reflect Jesus in our lives means there is going to be transformation. It means there is going to be change in your life, and there's no way around that. It's impossible literally impossible, unless you already had it all figured out, which I'll just let you know, you didn't. It's impossible to follow Jesus without there being change in our lives. I want you to look at the words from 1 John 
uh, chapter 2. And, and we'll come back to this section of Scripture a, a little bit later. But just look at the words of verse 6. Whoever claims to live in him, talking about Jesus, must live as Jesus did. Whoever claims to live in him must live as he did. That implies there is going to be some change. That our life is going to need to reflect Jesus' life more than it has reflected our own. It's in that change, it's in that transformation where at least I, I feel like I fall short. I feel like there have been many times where I've desired for change to happen and yet I end up very frustrated. Sometimes I've, I've just been ashamed. And when we talk about change, isn't it amazing how quickly, even in this just small part of conversation, how quickly we think of the things that we are not supposed to do. We think of the things that we would say are, are wrong. But I believe within this idea of change, it's also calling us to do something. There's a calling there to live life as Jesus did. And it's in that change, that kind of change, it will impact how I interact with others, how I handle the influence of culture in my life, how I deal with pressure, how, well, how I meet the needs of others, how I love my spouse, how I approach suffering, how I discern what's of God and what isn't. And it definitely will impact my attitude towards sin. So for the next couple of weeks, we're just going to try to unpack this because if I'm going to reflect Jesus, then I acknowledge there is going to be change in my life, and yet change can become very difficult. Change can be the hardest thing to deal with, even in a journey of faith. But in those times, I want to make sure in this week that we talk about some things that I think are foundational that you can go back to to make sure that you have the right motive, that you have the right heart as you approach any kind of change so that we can reflect Jesus well to those around us. Now, you're not going to find a magical formula, though, today or in the next few weeks. I'm not going to give you some secret prayer that has just the exact words to use. That's, that's not going to happen. We're just going to seek out true transformation in all of us that will reflect Jesus well. And we're not going to settle for living life with just a smidge of Jesus. We're talking about having Jesus completely change our lives, but also acknowledging change connected to faith can be difficult, or it seems to be. So it leads us to a question of why would you want to change? Why do you want to change? Why do you want to overcome something like lust? Why do you want to control your temper? Why do you want to forgive? Why, why do you want to love others? Why do you want to exude the joy of God? What is your why? That's part of what we're going to wrestle with. Why do you want to change in regards to your faith? I think there's some unhealthy ways that we do this. And unhealthy, I mean by our approach and our motive. I mean, some of us, I think we're trying, we'll change, but we're just trying to prove ourselves to God. Maybe if I impress him with this change, then, then he'll do something for me. Maybe if I do this, this, and this, then he's going to bless me in some way. Or, or maybe if some of you are even thinking, if I do this and this, then he'll love me. But the Bible already tells us that when we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. God can't love you any more than he already does. And yet we'll still try to prove ourselves. We'll try to earn his love, try to earn from him. And so our motive for change gets rooted in our actions, our choices, and fully in our power and in our control. Sometimes do we have an unhealthy approach when we approach change to prove ourselves to someone else. You know, people's approval can easily become one of the most important things to us. And so I start to do things that are, well, they're things of Jesus, but I'm trying to impress someone else. So is that really obedience to God, or is it more about me? I mean, doing things to impress others often doesn't lead to much longevity in any kind of change either, does it? I mean, at some point, we may look spiritual, but behind the scenes in our heart, it catches up with us. And eventually, we, we tend to respond, well, we either run, or maybe we blame someone, or someone 
um, or blame God, or we just break down. If I want to reflect Jesus in my life, there have got to be some healthy ways, some biblical ways to approach change. And how I approach change will impact my ability to enjoy following Jesus. I, I really do believe, even though this journey of life, we're not excluded from the storms of life, we still have to go through junk in this life, but I think following Jesus can be enjoyable. But if you miss out on how to function in some of the change and function in the transformation, then it's miserable. It's not meant to be that way. It's meant to be something we enjoy walking out with Jesus. So if we have to start somewhere, let's at least start today talking about ourselves and about God and talking about what we know about both of those. Because when things get hard, it's nice to have a foundation to go back to. When things get difficult, to have that foundation you can lean into, that place to go when we doubt or when we fail. We want to be able to go to those places. So let's start all the way back at the beginning of Scripture. Let's go back all the way to Genesis chapter 1. And we be reminded of some words that we find there in the story of creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Everyone, including you, was created in the image of God. We are made in his likeness. And this is a good time to be reminded that everyone means everyone. It's so easy sometimes to look at someone and only see the faults, only see the negative things, but remind yourself about them. Hey, they were made in the image of God. But you got to have that same approach with yourself. I was made in the image of God, and that matters. And if, ever, if I'm ever going to reflect Jesus, I have to remind myself I was made in his image. So what in the world happened? What in the world went wrong that you think of, okay, I'm in his image, but how has it gotten so messed up and, and distorted? Well, the answer is sin. When there's a reality of dealing with change and transformation that we have to acknowledge that sin is real and that sin has tarnished and, and is destroying the image of God within us. I want you to go to Romans chapter 3 and see the words that are written here in regards to sin, but also in regards to the answer to sin. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. We've all sinned, okay? That it's, that's a statement about all of us, but it's also identifying the problem. We fall short. No matter how hard we try to, to, to live up to what we think God wants, we will fall short in our own abilities. You can't make yourself right with God. So we're going to fall short in our actions and our words and our thoughts. And then if you really think it out, there are so many times where we reject him or we refuse to conform to his image. We fall short, and falling short is very costly. The Bible lets us know that we don't have the resources it takes to make, the, make it right. And God, he isn't offering a discount here. This isn't, a get, and you don't even get to pay as you play. All he is offering us is a free gift, well, at least free to us. I don't get to claim any credit for paying this debt of sin. It's all on him. Sin is the problem. And it's real. And it's there. And if we're going to live out transformation and change, we have to acknowledge sin. Quit calling it everything else. Get to the root of it and acknowledge what it is. Sin is the problem, but grace is the answer that God gives us. And how do he say that grace comes? Only through Jesus. Since the beginning of scriptures, we've seen people trying to live out the idea of faith. But they were doing it without Jesus. Whether they were trying to follow the law perfectly on their own, or maybe even there was groups that created extra laws to try to help them follow the law. No matter what they did, it didn't work. The only hope that we have of the image of God being repaired within us is through God's love that's found in Jesus. 
If we're going to reflect Jesus well, if we're going to approach change that's going to make us more like Jesus, if we're going to approach the transformation, we have to accept the truth about sin and the beauty of grace. Let's talk about grace a little more. I want us to go to Ephesians chapter chapter 2. If you look here, you, you see a section of Scripture once again talking about grace. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're not saved by our faith. It is by grace through faith. God's grace even helps us get to the point of having faith. He gives you the power to believe, but the act of believing, that is on us um, because he doesn't believe for us, he doesn't repent for us, but he equips us to do both. And he gives us the grace. So the idea of following Jesus, the idea of living out a transformed life and reflecting him well, that's not something we approach as an accomplishment it's something we as a re- approach as a response to God's grace, as a response to this gift that he's giving us. And I hope you see it as more than just saving you from hell. I hope you see beyond that, that grace is something, well, it's God at work wanting to make something beautiful out of us, and we are his work of art. When he talks about our, us being his handiwork, that grace meets you right where you are, but also takes us where we should be going which takes us back to that word of change and transformation. If we're going to reflect Jesus, we have to embrace this grace, not only at the beginning of the journey, but believing and resting in it each and every day. Grace does a great job of reminding you and me that we are not the Savior. Jesus is. And Jesus is the one who's going to help us experience transformation. Jesus is the one who's going to help us change. If we don't maneuver through change with grace, we'll probably revert back to trying to prove ourselves. Whether you're trying to prove yourself to God or someone else, when we operate outside of grace, we step back into the control instead of allowing God to be at work and us responding to his grace. Well, I want to point out one more thing. Let's go to that 1 John chapter 2. Look at these first few verses. He said, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. I desire to change. I desire to look more like Jesus. I want to come in alignment with what God is doing. But sometimes the change just seems so hard. And there are so many times where our struggles with change are often connected to sin. But John seems to address this. And I like how John addresses this because he tells, he talks about sin. He clearly says, we shouldn't sin. I mean, he says, don't sin. I mean, he speaks that very clearly. But then he follows it up with that statement. Don't sin, but he acknowledges we could. I don't think he's excusing our sin. I don't think, I'm confident he isn't saying we should sin. I think we we find in Scripture that we have everything we need to not sin through Jesus. And yet he makes this statement, he makes this point, if anyone does sin. How many of us struggle with the thought of transformation and change because of sin? His words, if anyone does sin... He doesn't say, try to fix it on your own. He doesn't say, "Uh, you need to handle this problem, it's on you. No, what does he say? He says, you have an advocate. It's not you going, okay, I'm going to do more, I'm going to pray more, I'm going to take this course of action. That isn't what followed those words. It says, we have an advocate. The language of that day, advocate would especially mean the friend of the accused, I love some of the different analogies that are out there that take this section of Scripture and really move it into almost a courtroom setting where God is the judge, Jesus is your advocate, and you are the one on trial. And so in the imagery that so many different writers have composed trying to help tell the story, they they talk about that when we sin, when we miss out on the change and the transformation, when we're choosing that, 
or even when we have that desire and we're trying to live out the faith, we're trying to follow Jesus, but we, we sin. He has a response for us. He says we have an advocate. So when we sin, God is the judge. Jesus is our advocate. He's our friend. And Jesus approaches the bench and acknowledges our guilt. And he says, but, but Father, Keith, Keith is here to make a full confession before you. He's here to acknowledge that he's wrong. And God asked your advocate, Jesus, well, what should his sentence be? And Jesus would respond, well, his, his sentence should be death. I mean, he, he deserves your wrath. But Father, Abba, Dad, this guy, this one, he belongs to me. And God would say, okay, he is guilty as charged, but the penalty has been satisfied. And they have imagined in these different writings that he would then say to Jesus, and he tells the advocate, I release him into your care. You are in Jesus' care. You don't start the journey of following Jesus and then get sent off on your own. He goes with us. And so the idea of transformation and change, we need to understand that he is with us. The expectation is not that you do it on your own, but that you lean into him, knowing that he's your advocate, knowing that when you fall down, he's there to help pick you back up, knowing that he is meeting you with love and grace and forgiveness helping you move forward, helping you change. He walks with you, making you holy, keeping you free from the power, former power of sin. But so many of us still try and experience transformation under our own power. We need to be reminded today and have this foundational thought in our mind before we start tackling some stuff in the next couple weeks that Jesus is with you, and he is going to help you change. The advocate is going to help you experience transformation, experience moving forward and making you holy. And I think we can reflect Jesus well when we live believing that he is my advocate, that he's with me, that he's walking out this journey. If we look at the rest of that section of Scripture, the next few verses, look at verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. And here's that verse again. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus lived. Interesting thoughts in this, just these few verses. I mean, if, if I know him, I do what he says I should do. And the word know there, it's not like sitting in a space where somebody walks by and you're going, oh yeah, I know him. No, this is talking about actually knowing them personally, in a relationship, that kind of intimate connection. I know him. And since I know him, I'm going to respond and I'm going to do what he says. Obedience, which often includes some kind of change, whether it's that calling or changing a behavior or an action is one of those things that when you're following Jesus, we need to lean into Jesus with our advocate in the midst of his grace and not our own abilities. It becomes a sign of a maturing faith when the motive behind any decision that we make, our acts of obedience are rooted in love. That's a sign that your faith is growing. That when you're obedient, when you are changing, when you are experiencing that transformation, you are leaning into him so much because you love him and you trust him. And therefore, your response is that love and that trust. See, your relationship with Jesus should change your relationship with sin. Our relationship with sin used to be something we probably loved, planned for, found comfort in, but it's no longer, it's no longer the love of your life. That should be Jesus. So if I'm going to live in him, I trust that he'll make me want to live as he did. Part of the transformation is new desires, a new mindset, a new heart. 
that you got to listen to. Sometimes the voice of sin will be loud, and the voice of Jesus will seem so much like a whisper. But we've got to learn to be in tune with him, believing in that whisper, listening for that whisper, looking and seeking it out. Because we already know that sin and the world around us is going to be so loud. We've got to chase the whisper. So what is it? What is it you want to change? What is it that you want to change so that you reflect Jesus better? Is it a behavior? Is it a sin? Maybe you're just missing an aspect of Jesus' character. What would it mean for you to reflect more and more of Jesus? I can assure you of one thing. Don't perform for Jesus. Stop performing and just start following, loving, and responding to the grace that's been shown to you. Because you will see that he gives us new affections, he gives us new desires, new motives, and that's what leads to new behaviors, new disciplines, new actions. Changing things in our life from feeling like it's something that I have to do to something I want to do because I love responding to his grace. Stop trying to do all of this without Jesus. You need him. You need him to take any steps of this journey. Stop trying to do it on your own. And maybe today before we dive into these next few weeks and and just really try to dig deeper into how to live that out to become a better reflection of Jesus, You need to be reminded of the truth that you were made in his image. And that somewhere in the middle of this week, tell yourself that. That when the temptation comes on strong, you need to be reminded of the truth that sin is real and sin is ugly and it used to be in control, but God's grace is now greater. It's greater in your life than it's ever been before. And you're going to trust him. And you're going to remember you are not alone. The advocate is with you. What I'd like for you to do, just right where you are, in these next few moments, can we just do the best that we can to just reflect? Reflect on who you are. Reflect on how you've been approaching change and transformation in your life. And acknowledge if you've been trying to do it on your own. And in a few minutes, we're, we're going to come back and we're going to pray. We're, we're even going to sing a little bit. But I want you to just take a few minutes in some silence, as best as you can come up with silence, and just have a conversation with Jesus.